uh, and then you can talk about the Lamborghinis in terms of uh, your handheld computers or tablets or, or whatever that you have, the electronic devices nowadays. They can still compute and, and they can give uh, quick information to you and, and do things very fast. But how about if you need something dramatically different? Where is the aeroplane there? And quantum computing is actually the aeroplane of computing. So this is what quantum computing is going to do. It is going to revolutionize how we do computing. And going back to the same analogy that do if we have the aeroplane, do we not need the cars anymore? No, so we the same way as we need the cars, even if we have quantum computing, we will still need the classical computing or the computing that we do with our uh, laptops and desktops and mobile phones nowadays even. So those are still going to be there, but quantum computing is going to revolutionize some of the aspects of computing, which are, let's say, uh, taking long to compute, to, to, to do calculations nowadays. I will, I will go into the details later on, but this is, this is kind of like the basis for, for quantum computing. And this is the why, this is why we need quantum computing. And then uh, what I always uh, try to uh, say about quantum computing uh, from the why perspective is, is this uh, figure. Uh, this is uh, what we, uh, the English proverb is about uh, finding a needle in a haystack. So the, the person here is holding a needle and, and uh, he found the needle in the haystack and, and uh, the wise guy here is just saying how long it took him to find it. And, and quantum computing is, is about this. It's, it's about finding a needle in a huge haystack. So you can, you can, uh, and the proverbial needle in, in, in this case uh, with computing is, is finding the right answer to a question. And, and the haystack being all the parameters, all the, uh, let's say, variables and all the things that you have in, in different equations and different uh, sort of uh, computational uh, aspects. Uh, but all those are, are, are there. And within those, you, you have to find the needle. So, enormous amount of data with enormous amount of equations and everything and the finding the right information out of that is like finding the needle and classical computers or, or the computers that we have in, uh, at our disposal nowadays uh, i will from now on refer to them as classical computers and that includes uh, let's say supercomputers uh, i i i'm not going to talk about supercomputers but it's it's an assumption uh, let's say for now that Supercomputers are a much faster and bigger version of computers. So the supercomputers are, are able to do this uh, now, but for them finding that needle, proverbial needle in a haystack, uh, haystack can take hours or weeks in, it, in some cases. And that is because of, of the amount of data that they have to uh, work through and the, uh, the variables and the equations that they have to work with. So this creates a lot of uh, computation and that takes a long, long time. So finding that proverbial needle within that takes a long time for the supercomputers and the classical computers. So what quantum computing is, is going to do, and, and that's the hope based on the fundamentals, is uh, it will make finding this proverbial needle very fast. So for example, calculations that took, uh, let's say months or weeks uh, to do will now be, or when the quantum computer is ready, will take uh, seconds or minutes to do. So that's a dramatic shift. So from Lamborghinis to, to jets in a way. And this is, this is kind of like the, the, the driver for, for doing a quantum computing. So once again, very, very, uh, much uh, revolving around real life applications and, and things that are not a big problem now, but as we gather more and more data, as we go into more and more computation, this will become an issue. And then uh, uh, let's say solutions like quantum computing will be essential to, to, to solve those problems. So these, these are the two, uh, let's say, aspect of, of why we need quantum computing. And, and 
this is this has been the driver. So people uh, in the scientific community have realized long ago that uh, the amount of data that the digital age is going to generate will be a, will become a problem at some point, and and then the computational capacity of, of classical computers will not be enough and we will need solutions. So that sort of have started their thinking, uh, let's say way back in, in 70s when even the computers were in their early stages. So, but they were thinking far enough to understand that, okay, this will become a problem. We need to have an alternative solution. And, and that's what uh, triggered this how. So how do we solve this problem? How do we build a quantum computer or at that point of time, what would be the solution? And how do we find a solution to this uh, massive data handling and computation problem? And for this how part, uh, let's go back to the history in the 70s. As I said, that people started looking into this problem and then uh, in, 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 uh, in history of, uh, of humankind, there has been this issue or, or there has been this topic called quantum mechanics which uh, let's say evolved or, or came about in, in 1920s uh, when the first uh, quantum mechanical phenomena was dis disclosed and how the operations happened were, were, were disclosed. And at the onset of it, quantum mechanics was kind of, uh, or it still is, is, is kind of uh, non, let's say, uh, it's not intuitive from our classical perspective. So we cannot imagine things uh, that happens actually in the quantum domain where we go into subatomic particles and things happen very, very differently that would otherwise not be possible in the classical domain. And one of the aspects uh, of quantum mechanics, uh, or, or for me, when I was studying quantum mechanics, it, the, the thing that boggled me uh, was uh, this thing called quantum tunneling. And uh, as you see in the picture, uh, in classical world or in the world that we live in, uh, if you find a barrier or if you see a hill when you are driving a cycle or a car or walking, you go above the barrier, you, you cross the barrier and you, you circumvent that. But in quantum mechanics, uh, you don't have to do it. You, you can just tunnel through the barrier. And, and this is something that is, is very, very non-intuitive from a classical perspective. How can you just go through a wall? I mean, if you, if you think of, uh, let's say, Harry Potter and, and how he can go into the nine and three quarter platform, that's fine in, 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 in fairy tales, but how does it actually work in quantum mechanics? But it actually does happen. So this is a fact from a quantum mechanical perspective that you can tunnel through a barrier. And this kind of, uh, sort of phenomena was the, was the first driver for people to start thinking, okay, can we use this kind of non-classical uh, way of, of uh, happening or, or non-classical uh, physical uh, phenomena to do computation as well? Because in classical computers, what you see is, is uh, what we call bits. So ones and zeros, and they are uh, formed by something called a transistor. And when a transistor is on the on state, it's one, when it's in the off state, it's zero. So that's basically what you have in your chip. So there are billions of transistors which are switching between one and zero and you get all those ones and zeros and, and, and get the processors and so on. But that's very classical. So how about going to a quantum mechanical uh, sort of equivalent of it and see if we can find a solution that can be even uh, more uh, fascinating or, or more revolutionary. And, and this uh, thinking started and, and around 1980s, this is again, uh, uh, science has a lot of uh, these kind of coincidences or, 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 or uh, serendipities that you, you have these things where some people actually come up with the same idea in different parts of the world because they have been thinking independently and came up with the solution almost at the right at the same time. This has happened in many, many cases in, in, in physics and other uh, areas as well. But this was interesting from quantum, uh, let's say computation perspective that Yuri Manin in, 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 in Russia 
Paul Benioff in, in uh, Argon, and Richard Finman, uh, who is a maverick and is, is, a, is a role model for many of us who studied physics. They came up with the idea of doing computation with the quantum mechanical phenomena almost at the same time. And, and the idea was how to build a model which, which sort of takes the quantum mechanical phenomena into a computation definition. And uh, these, are, these are sort of very high end mathematical and, and quantum mechanical, uh, quantum mechanics or quantum physics kind of things. But the main message is that it was possible to do. So whatever we were doing computation in the classical domain, equivalent of it could be done in the quantum mechanical domain as well. And, and Finman had this uh, uh, sort of quote, which I put it here, that the class nature is not classical, damn it. So if nature is not classical, if there is a quantum mechanical phenomena already existing in nature, so there must be a quantum mechanical solution. And hence, they had the solution how to build a quantum computer out of uh, quantum mechanical phenomena. And, and this was the idea. So that's what triggered everything in, in 1980s. And since then, people have been doing it, all kinds of research. So they have been doing mathematics for algorithms. So how to build algorithms. So there are things like called Shor's algorithm and, and uh, Grover algorithm. Uh, Love Grover was an Indian who, who moved from Meerut to US in IBM and, and came up with the idea of, of uh, Grover algorithms. And then there were also experimentalists who were trying to build a quantum computer using uh, mechanical devices. That how, how do we bring the electrical, mechanical, optical devices together to actually build a quantum computer? So that sort of uh, triggered everything. And, and this went on for now for four decades. And finally, we are at a position where we actually see things happening. And what we like, what I will tell you now is how uh, that, that uh, or what are the basic fundamental things which uh, helps build a quantum computer. Uh, again, these are kind of like the phenomena that happens. So if you want, you can call them building blocks. That these are the things which are taken into account while building a quantum computer. There is a thing called uh, Di Vincenzo criteria for quantum computer that you can also uh, read separately. But they are all uh, sort of uh, falling back to these phenomena that I will talk, talk to you about. And the first among them is, is called superposition. And uh, again, before I go into all the details, I have to remind you that quantum mechanics is very, very non-intuitive from a classical perspective. So it is very hard to come up with classical analogies of quantum phenomena. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is a is a let's say the closest I think we can get in explaining it in, from a classical perspective. The, the, the reason you have to believe me, uh, even though it sometimes might sound we weird, is because the maths add up. So the maths actually work. And, and uh, now when we are actually building a quantum computer, we can see it working. So it, it works. It's just that it's very hard to understand sometimes. So uh, with that notion, let me start with superposition. So what superposition does is, uh, as, I sh as you have in this picture, so you have heard about uh, probabilities, perhaps. And, and you have learned about that when you flip a coin, you have a probability of 50-50 of, of, of uh, heads or tails. And, and that is fine. And that is how it works uh, classically. But how about if you flip a coin and you follow its path, and as you can see in this picture, that it's rotating in the air, right? So when it rotates in the air, it's a mixture of heads and tails where that it goes through in that time. And, and that actually happens in subatomic particles, that they are at, in a state of, uh, if I can loosely say, state of flux. So they are in a state where they can be both uh, heads and or they have a certain probability of heads and certain probability of tails. And the, addi the addition of that probability is one, always, the magnitude of it. But they can exist in both states. It, it Like normal uh, sort of bits, you don't have to have ones and zeros only, but you can have many different uh, possibilities between ones and zeros. 
and this is this is what superposition is that you you exist or the uh, subatomic particles exist in a, this state of uh, superposition or or in a mixture of heads and tails and this is this is the first starting point that the, you have to agree that 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 happens and and this uh, has been observed experimentally as well and then the other aspect is entanglement and and this is even weird <laughs> And I, I try to explain to you with some images and see if you if it gets uh, easier. But let's say you have a coin uh, like this here, and you can think of the coin as a subatomic particle. And you have a, a strange machine where if you put the coin, it splits into two, and one which comes up as heads uh, goes into a box A, and the other which comes as as tails goes into the box B, right? So you have two boxes, two separate boxes now with two separate coins, one with the heads inside and the tails uh, in the other. And, and uh, you don't know which box is heads and which box is tails. That is fine, but one has heads and the other has tails. And now what you do is uh, you take one of the box and you ship it to somebody, uh, ship it to your uh, friend, uh, let's say somewhere in the other side of the universe, hypothetically, or anywhere in the universe. And while they, it's getting transported to that person, it's getting shaken, it's getting handled. So the, the, the coin inside or the subatomic particle inside, it's getting, doing topsy-turvy, it's changing its state, and it's, it's in a different condition that it started with. So if, if box A had, uh, let's say, heads, the, uh, the coin inside box A had heads, it's, you never know how it ended up when it's uh, transported to the person you are sending it to. And at the same time, you can retain the other box or you can send it to another person and, and going through the same process of shaking and uh, jarring and, and, and changing the state of the coin inside. Now, the funniest bit is that uh, if either of these boxes is open, let's say this is opened by the person in the other side of the universe and this open it and see it head, uh, heads, the other box will inevitably have tails in it. It can be in nothing other than tails in that. And this, it's the same the other way around. So if somebody opens it and finds a tail in the coin, then you will, you, the other box will inevitably have head in it. And, and this, is, this is kind of spooky because it, it changes the whole concept of time in a way. So you don't have to, the information that you have in the box, which is on the other side of the universe, doesn't have to travel to the second box. To, to tell that, okay, I have heads, you, you should now go tails. It just happens. And, and this, is, this is what uh, Einstein called from when he saw the maths of it, that it's a spooky action in a, in a distance. And it is really spooky to understand from a classical perspective, but that's how it is. And that's how uh, things work. So this is called entanglement. And, and uh, this is one of the key aspects of building quantum computer, that you, you have to have this entanglement of, of the particles. And the third thing is, is called interference. And this is used in, in measuring, uh, uh, let's say, quantum uh, phenomena. And, and the, the spookiness about interference is, uh, for example, if you have a beam, if you have a device, which like, let's say, like a laser device, which uh, uh, gives out electrons, and you put it to a slit. So this, is, this black thing is a, is a cardboard box, let's say, with two holes in it. And if, if it goes to the first hole, uh, the electrons will stack up like this. So you will see something like a sand structure or, or, or a pile of sand. So the electrons will pile up like a uh, pile of sand. But the fun thing is, if you have opened both the holes and let the electrons go through both, you would imagine from a classical perspective that this is how they will turn up. But that's not what happens in a quantum mechanical world. What happens is, they actually end up being bigger as a sand pile or an electron pile in the middle where there is a barrier still. And, and this is uh, something that we, we, we call in physics uh, constructive and destructive interference. And, and this is how it works in terms of interference uh, phenomena in the quantum mechanical systems. And this is used uh, very, very, uh, uh, let's say frequently and, and uh, as a basis for doing quantum uh, computation or building a quantum computer. 
So again, something that is not very intuitive from a classical perspective. And the last thing uh, which uh, is important is, is coherence. And, and this is uh, something that I think is easiest to relate to in terms of uh, uh, quantum phenomena and quantum computing. So what it means is, uh, if you remember in the first case, I mentioned superposition. So you have a mixture of ones and zeros. So let's say you have this in a state where it's a mixtures of ones and zeros. And then with time, it actually changes. And, and uh, what happens is it separates between one and zero. So it gets to one or zero state. And this time uh, is very, very short. So it's in microseconds. And if your quantum information uh, sort of collapses into these ones and zeros, then you don't have the quantum state anymore and you cannot do quantum computing anymore. So you when, if you want to do quantum computing, you always have to, this, have, to have this state uh, where you can do quantum computation. And usually it's, it's uh, the, the, the decay or, or, or the, the reason the state collapses is because of uh, disruptions and, and disruptions can be temperature or heat it can be light, it can be sound, it can be uh, electrical uh, disturbances or anything that, that can disturb the quantum state. And the spookiest part is that if you actually try to measure this qubit, that also decays the qubit. So that also collapses the state. So how, then you, how do you then measure uh, without making it collapse? And, and that is uh, a very tricky bit in, in quantum computing that you have to have a long coherence time so that when you try to measure, you don't uh, cause decoherence or the collapse of the quantum state and, and you are able to measure. And, and uh, it's, it's, it, the analogy of it is something that you will find uh, if you go Google later on uh, as the uh, Schrodinger's cat, that if there is a cat in a box and it has a poison inside which is broken if you open the box and uh, when, whenever you open the box, you know that the cat is dead. But is the cat dead before you open the box? Because if, the, if you didn't open it, the poison was not broken, then the cat would have been alive. But you don't know it because you don't see it. So everything that you want to know, you have to measure it. You have to either see it or you have to do something to it to get a measure out of it or the information out of it. But in the, in the quantum mechanical phenomena, Whenever you try to do it, it collapses the state. So that, that's kind of like the, another tricky bit. So all these phenomena, all these things actually come together. And then there is a lot of mathematics, a lot of mechanics, a lot of uh, engineering now as well to, to bring this together to build a quantum computer. But these are the basics. These are the hows of, of a quantum computer. Uh, this is where I will stop in terms of hows, because there is a lot of mathematics after this, and there is a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, understanding requires how to combine all these four aspects to actually build a quantum computer. But that's a different story. What I will tell you now is, is uh, about when, that when do you see a quantum computer? We do now. So this uh, image that you see is a quantum computer uh, built by IQ, IBM. Uh, it's called IBM Q. And uh, this is how it looks. So as you can see, this is an actual image. So the people, the size of the people is, is, is equivalent to the size that you see of the quantum computer. And uh, so it's big. And this is how it was with the classical computer. The phone that you see in your pocket in 1950s, it was a room filled of computer which is with less uh, capacity to compute. So things evolved from there to where you have with the phones now. But this is how the quantum computer looks like now. It's, it's huge. And the most interesting bit perhaps is, is this red dot that you see here, because uh, all the quantum mechanical phenomena that I explained earlier uh, leads to something called a quantum information processor or quantum uh, processor, uh, QPU, quantum processor unit. And that is in this red dot. So it's a very, very small component where the, 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 the fun things actually happen. And all the rest that you see here, uh, the, the glowing stuff and the, uh, the shiny stuff are actually the engineering part of it. And what it means is uh, all the quantum mechanical phenomena, except for a few perhaps, happen at very, very low temperatures. So you have to freeze the subatomic particles so that they are 
moving in your command. So they don't vibrate, they don't move around randomly. So you have to control them. And you have the only way you can control them is if you freeze them to this extreme cold temperature. And, and uh, by extreme, I mean very, very close to absolute zero. And that's minus 273 degrees centigrade. And if we go into Kelvin, so that's close to zero Kelvin. And uh, the temperature that we use nowadays is in order of millikelvin. So thousands of, uh, uh, let's say, parts lower than one Kelvin. And, and this is the temperature which we have to go to to control the qubits. And, and the whole shiny bit here is that thing. It's called a cryostat or a fridge in a simple term. And all this does is cools the, the temperature down in this point to that uh, millikelvin temperature. And of course, there are the, also readouts. Uh, so uh, the quantum mechanical information has to convert it into an electrical signal that you can read with uh, some gadget, some, let's say, voltmeter or ammeter or signal generator, so cl classical electronics. And this, this uh, happens through wires, which go th goes through here. And, and the measurement panels are behind this box somewhere hidden. So it's, it's not uh, the whole story. There are things behind this as well. But that's how it is. That's how the engineering aspect of, it, of this is. Uh, one more thing that is good to know is uh, this machine is particularly built out of superconducting qubits. Don't ask me what is superconductors. I'm taking the assumption that you know what a superconductor is, but this is this is a, a, a sort of magical element which conducts uh, with without any resistance at, at very low temperatures, and and uh, this is what the material is here. So we the the IBM machine is based on superconducting qubits, transmon qubits, and this is exactly what we are also using in building the Finland's first quantum computer as well. So this is, this is how it is. So things are happening now. Uh, you already can see a quantum computer. And in India as well, we will soon have the first quantum computers as well. So things are being built. They are not the best machines that you can imagine uh, because what we have right now is, is uh, again, not the best quantum machines. Uh, the quantum machines need to improve. The computers need to improve to go to that uh, state where you can actually find the needle in a haystack in, in a very efficient way. We are not there yet. So this is the first generation or second generation of things that are happening right now. And then uh, finally, the topic about what, what can we do and how, what will happen? It's, it's, I will start with the fact that it's a long way to go. As I said, things are in the very early stages. We are building the first quantum computers, but they need to evolve uh, very, very uh, sort of uh, strongly to go to a stage where can, they can do a lot of fascinating stuff as a computer, so they can actually compute. Now the challenge is in the electronics or in the engineering of building the quantum computer, and the next challenge is uh, to make it uh, compute something that is that is cool. And and. Uh, Again, I, I won't go into the details of it, but here you can see it's, it's almost everything that are, we do in life and, and happens around us that will be affected by quantum computing. And uh, it, it goes from, uh, let's say, energy efficiency to, to weather pattern and uh, autonomous driving to finding new materials, finding new drugs or finding new pharmaceutical molecules, many, many different applications. One thing that actually uh, might help you understand what uh, quantum computing can do is, is uh, from a weather perspective. So as you know, we, we in India, especially uh, and in Finland, it's not that, uh, that we get uh, typhoons or, or tornadoes here, but in India, in the Eastern part, we, we almost see these kind of weather patterns where there is a typhoon which strikes. And if you look at the pictures that come from the satellites and, and uh, then they are analyzed with supercomputers, they give a path, but they cannot tell you how narrow the path is. So they can say it will strike here or it can strike here or it can strike here as well. We don't know whether it's going to go, where, which direction it's going to go. And that is because of the lack of computational capacity to predict 
how, how we can uh, judge the weather patterns. So with quantum computers, the ideal situation would be that you would exactly know where it's going to hit. And, and that is what kind of uh, computation that we hope to achieve with quantum computers. We cannot do it now, but in 10, 15 years, when we have a very good quantum computer, which can do very good calculations, we will probably hit that spot. We can probably say, okay, it's not going to hit Kolkata, but it might be hitting uh, uh, Diamond Harbor. So th that's kind of like, like the precision that we would like to go to, but uh, we are not there yet. And, and with the current uh, classical computers, it's, it's not possible to, to do those kind of analysis. Or let's put it this way, it's, it's not possible to do those kind of analysis within a certain time frame. It will take even a long, long time. The, the typhoon will be long gone by the time you get the calculations back. So it doesn't make sense. So that's that's kind of like uh, the applications that we are going for. And, and uh, if, if, if I sort of summarize all these applications, it's all about finding the needle in the haystack. So everything that these uh, applications will be doing is about finding that proverbial needle within the haystack. And that's what we are going for. And that's what we are trying to find out to, uh, with quantum computers. And hopefully, uh, not yet, not yet, but in 10, 15 years, uh, we will be hopefully in a position that uh, we can do some of these in a, in a reasonable way. And uh, if, you, if you talk about numbers, I think it's important to, to let you know so qubits are, are uh, the basis for quantum computers. So like you have bits in classical computers, we have qubits. But the power of a single qubit is enormously higher than, or let's say a power of multiple qubits is enormously higher than the classical bit. So when I say we have just built a quantum computer, which is five qubit, it might give you the impression, oh, that's five bits. What will I do with it? Actually, that's not true. A five qubit machine can do quite many things already. And, and in that sense, uh, the world as it stands now, uh, it, 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 there are machines which are hundreds of qubits. In some cases, uh, the numbers vary, but uh, IBM, for example, have a 127 qubit machine uh, that they launched this year. Uh, which is based on their chip called Eagle, which is 127 qubit uh, processor. And, and those numbers are not much, but the, the, the capacity or, or the computational ability of those uh, few hundred of qubits is, is quite good. Uh, the other aspect that you should know is uh, the quality of the qubit is, is now what we call the dirty qubit or the noisy qubit. We are going for a qubit which is pure, uh, where there is no noise. And when we go to that, uh, or we are able to get there from the engineering perspective, the ability of the qubits will be much bigger or, or much better. So they can do better computation with the pure qubits rather than the dirty or noisy qubits that we have right now. So that's another aspect. So these are, these are kind of like how the things are happening right, uh, at this moment. But in, in, again, it will be happening in your lifetime where you will see quantum computers being able to do things like here, predict weather patterns, which are absolutely spot on. So that's the goal that we, we have in mind. With that, I come to the end of my monologue. And I will, as I said, I will be really happy to, to take questions. And please, please do remember, there are no wrong questions. You can ask any question you want. It's only that I can, or I might give some wrong answers, but that's up to me. It's not on you. So fire away. Thank you very much for paying attention and, and listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Mazumdar. Uh, Mrs. Mazumdar, I'll request you to curate the questions. So the first question I have is, uh, well, there is a, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, sir, we, uh, can we create a quantum computer by controlling spin values of particles? Yes, of course you can. And, and that is the uh, idea of uh, different types of cube, uh, quantum computers. So I was talking about superconducting 
quantum computers, but there is something called a spin qubit or spin quantum computer. And, and that is a path which, for example, Intel has chosen that they want to do spin qubits. So you can very much so do uh, quantum computing with spins, yes. That was a very good question. Any other questions you can raise hand? Um, I do not have the post, so I cannot read the questions in the chat box. I, I have it. I, I okay, right, it. right, sir. So there are, there is a next one. Uh, we can achieve quantum computing using other base two systems. Uh, no, sir, uh, excuse me, sir. What I meant was that, I mean, other than base two systems, like base eight or 10, if we can control the spin values of computers, then is that achievable then? then it will be I, far, uh, yeah, go ahead. Then I think it will be far easier if we can, you know, achieve, you know, uh, computing other than, I mean, other than base two systems with more than zero and one values. Yeah. Uh, by that, you mean the binaries or, or do you mean the base two, which is uh, out of, uh, I mean, the qubits are calculated as the powers of two. So two to yes. the power. Yeah, yes, I, I mean, binary systems other than like, you know, I haven't actually taken computers, so I don't remember the name. So, you know, Octa, octa, head, octa system, all the other systems. Yeah. Or the so, best uh, system. Ideally, I would imagine so if there are uh, theoretical uh, proof of that, I am not uh, aware of any engineering aspects of it. So I, I wouldn't know particularly, but it's worth looking. I, I, I have to look about it myself. So I, I don't have a yes or no answer for you. The next question is, uh, can quantum computing be used to upgrade the observatories for deep space explorations and the access information for the back holes? Uh, yes, but you have to imagine, I mean, now think about the fridge that I showed you in the picture from a uh, uh, built perspective, that would be not very efficient to take a quantum computer as it's now to space. But uh, what we are, trying to do is, is gather the data and analyze it using quantum computers. So yet yeah, though the observatories are already using some uh, AI, they will be using neuromorphic AI at some point. And then uh, quantum computing will definitely be uh, one of the possibilities that they would be used, but on the ground stations, of course, yes. Does the concept of logic gates work in quantum computing? Oh, that's the, that's the, I mean, if you want to do, uh, yeah, so let me think what you mean by logic gates. So I, I'm assuming by logic, you mean uh, not binary kind of logic gates. Uh, there are gates. So in quantum computing, using the qubits, you can formulate gates. And, and those are the building blocks for com uh, algorithms. So in that sense, yes, you can build logic gates. But those are not equivalent of the logic gates that you think in the classical perspective. So those are not the same classical logic gates. And not gates. Yes, I mean, those are, those are possible. Yes, of course. What line of study should we take to pursue a career in research in quantum computing? Well, physics is the mother of all things. So if you want to study quantum computing, then physics is a must, I would say. And then it depends on whether you want to go into the uh, computational side, do the maths, uh, then you will be going into the, uh, the quantum theory kind of activities. But if you are interested in building quantum computers and actually doing uh, experiments, then that would be the engineering aspect of it. And that would be what we call quantum technology right now. So you, you have option to do both, but I, I, I would say at uh, some, or, a good level of physics is needed no matter what you do. For doing quantum information theory, you can actually do mathematics as well. That's a, also a good way of getting to that. And uh, I know friends who have done uh, computer science 
and have gone into that direction. So that's also a possibility. Uh, I know, well, okay, first let me read the question. Uh, I want to become an aerospace engineer, but can I learn quantum computing from Lego or CERN by doing internship with them? Uh, with CERN, I know, I'm not sure about Lego, but with CERN you can, because they have a quantum computing initiative right now. And uh, they are, uh, I, I heard that they are uh, interested in taking interns to, to, to CERN. So yes, you can. Uh, I'm not sure if they have a quantum computer, but they have access to quantum computers which are available in cloud. So yes, you can. Very good question so far. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to see that you, you, you have, uh, so, uh, as of now, you have interest in quantum computing. That's very uh, nice to hear and read. And I would, I would definitely suggest to, to look a bit deeper into the topic. And, and it is a fascinating field. And uh, at this point, uh, the basic science is evolving into technology. So uh, it's, it's good to keep in mind that aspect so that you don't get uh, too driven into the theory part. There is a theory aspect of it, but I think the challenge, uh, if, I, if I think of it from a country perspective, we, we need uh, quantum engineers and quantum algorithm, uh, gen, uh, let's say experts. So quantum software and quantum engineers. So that is perhaps one career option you, you can think about rather than hardcore quantum information theory. That is good, of course, but uh, there are needs for engineers and, and, and uh, coders as well. Tom Mugnu, please unmute yourself. Yes, ma'am. So, sir, about quantum tunneling. So it might be, this concept is might be very useful in long range communication and in the distant future teleportation. So, but, and, but I haven't yet found any kind of substantial study on this, on this specific topic, not in, on the internet. So, there is a press prediction in I found a specific side that by 2022nd century we will achieve small amount of teleportation. What is your opinion on this matter? Yeah, that that's a very good question. Actually, a lot of people ask this same question: like, How when can we teleport and become like Star Trek uh, people? Well. Uh, it's not easy it, and, and uh, all things that we are discussing and we have been discussing and we are doing is, is on subatomic level and they are all in the quantum mechanical realm. So to bring a classical equivalent of it is, is not easy at all. And I would be really surprised if somebody says or puts a date when we can have teleportation because that's linked to entanglement that I was talking about. And, and that, that would be extremely, extremely challenging. Um, and and uh, it's, it's hard to say when, and it's hard to say when uh, in terms of larger objects even. So there are some fun experiments which are going on to see if we can actually transfer it to, to, to uh, real world objects uh, rather, or macro objects, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's still a long, long way to go. Yes, sir. I've heard of those experiments. I'm kind of looking at them right now, but but it looks like it's far away. Another thing, sir, about the simulation theory. So, uh, uh, yes. So, yeah. Uh, I did have one tab open about uh, how how can we, you know, completely predict. Uh, Sorry, sir, I cannot ask this. I kind of lost this. I'm extremely sorry. Take your time. I will go to the next question where you gather your thoughts. That's fine. So the next question was, is time travel possible in quantum mechanics? Uh, if we get to go to the entanglement, that, that was the idea of, uh, or that is the basis of time travel, that you, you, you can actually uh, be somewhere uh, faster than, let's say, without, irrespective of time. And, and, and that, uh, again, a very, very theoretical idea. We have not seen any proof that you can actually do time travel <laughs> with quantum mechanics. So I, I would be very skeptical to say, yes, you can.
Any more questions? There is one just that just came. Um, already a flight data recorder is available in aeroplanes that uh, on and how, according to you, is quantum computing can add to its. Sorry, I have to read it again. Already a flight data recorder is available in aeroplanes. Then how, according to you, time uh, quantum computing can add to in the simulation? Will it mean no human control of commercial aeroplanes and military jets? Ah, uh, simulation is a generic word. And what you are referring to in this case is a flight simulation, I suppose. And uh, this, uh, well, from the flight simulation perspective, that is going to be automated uh, soon. Uh, we, we do not have to wait that long for that. And that's a diff different topic because that can be done with classical solutions already. But what I meant by simulation perhaps is, is a more generic level of uh, simulating quantum uh, information theory. So if you, if you have a, a, um, let's say a problem that you can try to simulate using a classical computer, but uh, based on quantum mechanical understanding, that you can do, but it's it's uh, about writing the equations in a classical computer. So you are doing or doing quantum mechanical calculations in a classical computer. So that's not quantum computing, that's quantum simulation, and that's what simulation is on a general level. So you you, you have to have a distinguish between a distinguishment between uh, what is quantum computing and what is quantum simulation. Quantum simulation is doing quantum mechanical calculations in a classical computer, and quantum computing is doing computation with the quantum computer. So that's that's two different aspects there. I do not see any more questions, but I'm happy to answer. We have still a minute. Any other questions, queries? Uh, so, yes, Tamugno. Yes, sir. Somebody had previously asked about time traveling in using this system. So, I kind of uh, 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 I kind of uh, have a uh, I kind of have a system as to how to create a time well, wormhole using this uh, using a micro wormholes using the quantum systems. Uh, and if 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 it is possible to create a micro wormhole, then obviously it, if uh, then obviously it is definitely possible for you know time travel now it is hypothetical i understand i can see that you are smiling but it is still an idea it is i mean there yeah. are, if if the let's put it this way what i would say is if the maths work out then yes it is possible but to build it in an actual system that's a different story altogether and that's where the challenge is from a uh, uh, builder's perspective but theoretically if the maths is sound Yes, why not? If it if if it's proven by maths, then it's possible. But we 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 will probably not be able to build it in the right way uh, mm -hmm. anytime soon. Stephen Baxter has an interesting idea regarding this. Sure. Yeah. I think we've come to the end of questions question and answer session now. Ma'am. Right. Thank you, Dr. Majumdar, for this session. We have learned a lot. And I'm, I'm really intrigued by the questions that the children have uh, put across to you. Uh, I didn't even think about it the way they have. Thank you, children. And thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.